Para Watch. From Bigfoot to the Illuminati, conspiracy theories have been around for a great deal of time, as some humans attempt to rationalize something that they cannot or will not comprehend, generally involving a secret cover-up or suppression. In the SCP universe, the SCP Foundation are the masters of cover-ups and suppression, as many anomalies tend to crop up in very public scenarios, forcing the Foundation to come in and sweep it all under a rug. While they generally do a very good job of this, keeping the public blissfully unaware of the existence of anomalies, it's inevitable that some things slip through the cracks. One group that tries to pick up on these crumbs is known as Parawatch, and even though they're far, far away from ever really stumbling upon the Foundation, they have done enough to pop up on the Foundation's radar. Parawatch is a very loose group of conspiracy theorists, cryptid hunters, and paranormal enthusiasts operating with the intention of investigating and exposing the anomalous. They have no formal organization, no hierarchy, and no base of operations outside of their own internet forums. Most of their members hail from North America and Europe, but they come from all walks of life. They generally don't physically work with one another in a broad sense, partly due to desire for anonymity and partly due to the sheer spread of the user base. Members spend their time compiling stories and information on paranormal phenomena or other unusual events, and occasionally physically investigate said phenomena. If they were more organized and more capable, the Foundation might have to step in and amnesticize the whole lot of them, but as it stands, they're generally pretty far off the mark. Based on Foundation monitoring, Parawatch has yet to fully comprehend the existence of the Foundation, the fact that the Foundation maintains a veil of secrecy, and the nature of anomalous phenomena. That is not to say that some members haven't stumbled onto anomalies, as we'll see, but between the overall lack of context and information about these anomalies, as well as the fact that the general public will take whatever Parawatch has to say with a hefty grain of salt, the Foundation isn't worried. In fact, the Foundation actually uses Parawatch as a method of spreading disinformation, leading people away from actually investigating proper anomalies. While there are more tales related to Parawatch than SCPs, it's SCPs we're interested in for now, so let's look at a handful that Parawatch have managed to take a peek at, starting with something that's pretty light on Parawatch involvement. SCP-4240 is a series of instructions for something referred to as the Roundabout Game, originally posted on the Parawatch forums. The first step is to pick at least four doors in your house, and at most eight, making sure you can walk through them in a loop. Then you should number each door clearly, ideally using chalk. Third, at midnight, start walking through the doors in order and after walking through the last one, go through the first one again, completing the loop. The instructions note that after 10 loops or so, you'll see what the fuss is about, but make sure to not leave the loop until you reach the staircase, and then all will be well again. Following these instructions will cause the subject to access an extra dimensional space, disappearing from observation after three of the loops. The space appears identical to the previous location at first, but after completing further loops, the environment will grow darker and new rooms will begin to appear in between the doors. Any subject that breaks the loop by going back through a door they just passed through will return to normal space after receiving an injury from an unknown source. The severity of the injury will be based on how many loops the subject had completed, with those that complete less than 25 loops surviving with major bruising to the face and limbs, while those that do more than 25 loops are killed via blunt force trauma. Additionally, past 25 loops, recordings of subjects have shown them reporting feelings of being watched, followed, and touched by an invisible presence. Prior to the Foundation's involvement, 
there were no reports of anyone having won the game as mentioned in the instructions. Taking that as a challenge, they threw a D-class into a loop and told him to continue for as long as possible. After three loops, the D-class remarks that he can no longer see anyone through the thin plastic walls, and something feels weird with the floor. It slowly starts to get darker, and by loop six, a new room appears between doors three and four, with brick walls. The D-class also comments on the stench, finding rotting chicken inside of some bags in the room. By loop seven, all of the flimsy plastic walls have become incredibly sturdy, and by loop 16, a hallway appeared after the brick room, making the loop take a good deal longer. By loop 20, another room with rotting chicken appeared after the hallway, and it's now dark enough that the D-class is stumbling over his own feet, even with a flashlight. During loop 25, he comments that there's something behind him, and during loop 35, the presence now presses against him whenever he stops walking. It was cold at first, but it's been getting warmer, and he doesn't want to turn around. During loop 42, the presence is now on the D-class's back, with its arms around his neck. He stops remarking on the loop number at this point, but notes that there are now 17 rooms in the loop containing rotting chicken. He also sometimes passes through his childhood bedroom, or his prison cells, or his foundation quarters. The presence is now breathing against his cheek, and a moaning sound is heard on the recording that he claims wasn't him. The presence then begins to gnaw on his ear, but he can't really feel it. He can reach behind him to feel the presence's face, comparing it to the movie about the elephant man. The D-Class later realizes that he's no longer walking in a circle, but instead a downward spiral. He then mentions how, when he was a child and angered his mom, she'd tell him about the twin that he killed in her womb, and how good of a son he would have been. It always made him feel like a monster, but now he's feeling like he's been redeemed somewhat. The sound of tearing meat is then heard, followed by sounds of licking and laughing. The recording ends with him saying, Love you, buddy. Loop 99. Stairs. The D-Class was in the extra-dimensional space for nearly 26 hours before reappearing and collapsing from exhaustion. Afterwards, in an interview, a doctor asks him how he is feeling, but he doesn't respond initially, only looking at his hands while grinning. He says that after 25 hours in pitch dark, you forget what your hands look like. He seems to be in remarkably good spirits considering his ordeal, and says that there was some sort of invisible thing hanging onto his back, but it dropped off once he reached the stairs. He smiles and says that he thinks it might be dead. In a stark contrast to what's generally expected of D-Class, this D-Class was kept under observation for a month for anomalous properties before being released from custody. Usually, the Foundation is thought of as keeping D-Class around until they're dead or worse, but there's no canon. Obviously, the nature of this entity inside of this space intrigued the Foundation, so they sent in another D-Class. Six hours after being sent in, the D-Class's beaten corpse reappeared. Looking at his recordings, it seems that he became intimidated by a pile of human viscera that had appeared during a loop, causing him to flee. This meant that he went back through a doorway, resulting in his death. Analysis of some of the viscera from the D-Class's shoe showed it to be genetically identical to the other D-Class. The entity released from the site has yet to be found. Whether the entity was some sort of anomalous body snatcher waiting for someone to get far enough in the game, or was someone who had previously won and was finally released, will remain unanswered. Moving on then, to SCP-4430, 
copies of the short story The Faceless Live in Evanholly by Clyde Hiller. The cover of the book has varied over the years, but it's generally presented as a paperback book targeted at young children containing various illustrations. The book seems to have the anomalous trait of causing a small percentage of suggestible individuals to go missing. The Foundation has so far no idea how it accomplishes this or how it picks victims, and they haven't been able to cause the effects to manifest during containment. Parents that have purchased the book for their children rarely deny doing so, but also don't have any explicit memories of doing so. Most of the time, the book is not actually read by the child, only being discovered after their adolescence. So far, only five children have been identified to have gone missing, in ways that could not be explained by other causes. The latest was in 2015. Before that, in 2006, a pair of twins went missing after their parents bought a number of books, including 4430. That was after many years where no children went missing due to 4430, since 1975. The first child identified linked to the book was in 1971, who was last seen by a passerby clutching a copy of 4430. Notably, the child possessed a mild case of a genetic malformation in their face, causing a rash-like appearance. In a post on the Parawatch forums in 2015, a user goes into greater detail about the book comparing it to Watership Down and The Plague Dogs as children books that stick with you. The book was first published in 1968, apparently, although the Foundation has yet to find further information that supports this, but has never gained much attention outside of close-knit literature communities. This means that it's generally found in charity stores and yard sales buried beneath other discarded items. Despite the poor sales figures since its publication, the book has gone through a number of different editions, each with new cover artwork. The first edition only had the title and author printed on the cover, but the second edition in 1971 featured a small porcelain mask splattered with red paint. The third edition in 1975 featured two small porcelain masks being raised by a figure from below the frame with the red painted mask on the right. Although the fourth edition is known to exist, no one has any information on its appearance. The fifth edition was put out in 2006, featuring four porcelain masks submerged under a pond. The two on the left are identical, and the others are similar to those seen from previous editions. A hand is also seen reaching down towards the red painted mask. The sixth edition was apparently put out in 2015, but again, there's no further info on it. Obviously, the editions seem to correspond to the missing children, with the red painted mask corresponding to the child with the facial condition, and the identical masks corresponding to the twins. The rest of the post describes the actual story itself, which is set in 1960s America and focuses on a child named Leon who runs away from home after his parents berate him for a birthmark across his face. He runs into a forest near his home and attempts to survive on his own. He manages to make a shelter and finds some berries and fresh water, but cannot make a fire. As it grows darker and he becomes colder, he eventually decides to pick up a pointed rock in order to try and fix his face so he can return home. He stands at a pool of water looking at his reflection when a masked female approaches him, telling him to call her Masquerade. She asks him if he thinks his parents were right to berate him, and he does, seeing himself as freakish and cursed. Masquerade continues to ask him about his face, to which he says that he hates his face because it causes everyone else to hate him. Masquerade instead tells him that he shouldn't hate his own face, but instead hate everyone else that has cast him out. She goes on to say that he would be happier without a face at all, as then there would be nothing for anyone to hate him about. She asks 
if he would give her his face so that he could live in Evan Holly. He accepts, at which point she reaches forward and lifts his face off as if it were a porcelain mask. Leon states that he feels a sense of relief, like a weight was removed from his shoulders. The final illustration in the book is that of Masquerade standing in a clearing, alone, throwing a porcelain mask into a well. We're left without a whole lot of answers, although it's clear that there is a message meant to be taken from this. The children that went missing seem to have all been unhappy for some reason, with one having a facial condition similar to the one Leon had, and a pair of identical twins that perhaps were not happy about that arrangement. The story implies that all of these children chose to give their faces up so they could live in Evan Holly, but what exactly that entails and where these children are now are unanswered. SCP-5346 is a cognitohazardous phenomenon that may manifest upon viewing a specific scene from the film Forrest Gump which will result in severe cranial trauma to the viewer. The scene, in which the title character speaks a line about life being like a box of chocolates, does not exhibit any outward anomalous effects, but those that die because of the effect all shared an obsession about the phrasing of the quote. Most victims of the effect are longtime admirers of the movie, film analysts, and popular conspiracy theorists. The Foundation found out about the phenomenon thanks to some posts on Parawatch.net, which have since been removed by the Foundation. The first post about the phenomenon was posted in 2012, by a user who said that they had been spending time watching a number of films and shows from their childhood, including Forrest Gump, a film they cite as a particular favorite. They came across an issue with the Box of Chocolates line, with them vividly remembering the line to be Mama always said life is like a box of chocolates. When re-watching it, however, the line came out to be, Mama always said life was like a box of chocolates. The user doesn't want to start anything, but wonders why no one else is mentioning this. He is aware of the Mandela effect, in which groups of people claim to remember certain details that differ from reality but claims that this seems more sinister than that. Another user responded and said that they feel the exact same way, with the film now giving them the creeps, even though they don't know why. They remark that Forrest Gump throughout the movie seems to be watching them, and they bet that it has something to do with an unstable time lapse in reality, as maybe someone went back in time and changed the line for some reason. Another user also agrees, as they've had the movie on repeat for some time and feel that there's definitely something weird happening with the film, while a different user says that they've watched it at least a hundred times and aren't spooked about it. The original poster returns and writes that they haven't been able to stop thinking about Forrest Gump for the last two weeks, and now he's not even sure if the Tom Hanks in the film is this reality's Tom Hanks. He's also noted a lot of other weird oddities with the film, such as some uncomfortable glances towards the camera, or moments where it felt like the characters were referring to the watcher. He believes that the film might be a calling or a subtle nod towards conspiracy theorists about the plausibility of an alternate universe. By this point, other users have sort of given up on this being some sort of anomalous phenomena, but the original poster continues in another post, stating that he's absolutely terrified now. He admits that he's obsessed with the film, but he swears that he feels like Forrest Gump is even in his room sometimes, in the corner of his vision. He doesn't know if it's real or if he's delirious, but it feels real. He posts a picture of what seems to be Tom Hanks standing outside of his window, but says that it must be a fake image somehow. The Foundation agents that monitor the Parawatch forums noticed that the users that agreed with the original poster went inactive shortly after posting, a sharp change from their previous daily postings. 
agents only managed to find the original poster, deceased in his apartment. They discovered his cell phone with a draft for another post, in which he writes that he's not crazy, as whatever this thing is, it's on to him. He wrote the post while hiding in his closet, listening to something walking through his apartment. Whatever it is, it's not Forrest Gump, and it's not even human, but it is hungry. He called the police, but knows they won't arrive in time to save him, so he urges readers to not fall down the same rabbit hole as him, otherwise it'll come for them too. The poster was determined to have died from severe cranial blunt force trauma, and a note was discovered near his front door reading, Mama always said to stand up to snitches. I think the more left unsaid here, the better. Whatever force responsible for the altering of Forrest Gump doesn't want people investigating it too much. Let's finish with SCP-3840, an emaciated humanoid entity that manifests in the boreal forest region of Canada. It appears to be covered in severe burn wounds, stands at an estimated 2 meters in height, and is seen being ejected out of the forest reaching a height of 50 meters above the canopy of the forest, and then descending back into the forest around 20 meters away. It doesn't seem to be jumping, however, as its body appears to be largely limp during the entire process. This process lasts for a variable amount of time, usually around 3 minutes, during which it will move towards the nearest population center. Once it reaches a distance of around 20 kilometers away, it will de-manifest, although this has never been directly observed. Certain types of objects, notably deceased animals, damaged articles of clothing, and computers that enter an undetermined radius around the entity will begin to be pushed by an unseen force. This force will cause the objects to begin to move in a similar manner to the entity, which invariably causes them to collide with trees or the ground. The objects will also vanish along with the entity when it demanifests, and are not seen again. While the entity is manifested, it releases shortwave radio broadcasts at a frequency of 2156 kilohertz, consisting entirely of a repeating monotone buzzing sound. Finally, sightings of similar entities have also been reported in other places. On August 21st, 2015, the Foundation picked up a radio broadcast at 2156 kilohertz coming from a provincial park in Alberta, Canada, consisting entirely of a female voice repeatedly saying hello in English and French. The broadcast ceased after 12 hours, and Foundation agents were dispatched to the origination point. They discovered a campsite, a heavily damaged camping van, the remains of a makeshift radio tower, and burnt articles of clothing. The agents found a woman named Cyrielle Mercier inside of the van, a member of multiple online conspiracy theory forums, including Parawatch. They also recovered a cell phone containing a handful of files. The first file is an image of four young individuals, including Mercier, standing next to one another in front of the van. One of them is holding a sign, reading parawatch.net. Another is drinking from a beer bottle. And several cell phones, earbuds, and portable chargers are suspended in the air above them. A largely corrupted video file shows an entity resembling 3840 moving between branches, although the erratic movement of the camera and the speed of the entity prevents a clear view of it. It then begins to slow and goes limp on a tree branch, and later, after some corrupted footage, a small fire is present on the tree branch, with the entity no longer in sight. Another image shows Mercier and another individual sitting in lawn chairs next to an unlit campfire, their facial expressions suggesting that they are uncomfortable. Behind them is a collapsed and burnt tree, with the upper torso of a body underneath it. 
clothing on the body indicates that it belongs to one of the other individuals from the first image, and an antenna seems to be extending out of her head. A second video shows the interior of the van with all of the windows obscured. A black metal object is seen on the bed, and heavy breathing is audible. Loud scraping sounds are then heard outside of the van, which stop after 30 seconds, followed by a series of heavy impacts on all sides of the van. A hand is seen grabbing the black metal object, and the impacts stop. Mercier can be heard outside of the van, followed by the door opening, revealing the individual that was underneath the tree, now seen unharmed. She tells the person recording to keep quiet, or the ranger might hear, but she's cut off as three gunshots are heard, followed by a loud impact. Analysis of the series of impacts on the van revealed that it corresponds to a message in Morse code reading, Signal. Radio. Shut. Another video was taken by someone while running in the dark, illuminating the ground with a flashlight. A high-pitched electronic whine is heard, and the individual collapses, pointing the camera on the flashlight at SCP-3840, who is lying on the ground a meter away. The entity's mouth widens, revealing a megaphone, and a voice comes out of it matching a Canadian news anchor discussing the mobilization of all of Canada's military forces. An audio file on the phone consists of a repeating monotone buzzing sequence, which translated to Morse code reads, Wait signal for operation start. In the fourth video, two of the group are walking through the forest, with a small radio tower present in the distance. The two are having a conversation, but it's cut off by one of them being abruptly thrown to the side by an unseen force. The other individual doesn't even seem to react, and continues on to the radio tower. The subject drops the phone, showing his hand to be covered in burn wounds, and SCP-3840 is seen momentarily in the canopy of the trees, followed by a severed arm. One of the generators attached to the tower then forcibly detaches from the tower, causing it to collapse, and metal debris follows the path of the generator. A wet crunch is then heard in the distance. In the fifth video, Mercier is filming a person entirely encompassed in flames who is drinking from a beer bottle. Melting cell phones start falling out of the burning person's head, and Mercier tells them that if they spot anything, to come hollering, as you never know what's out here. She then turns and begins walking towards the van, which is also on fire. An image then shows members of the Rocky Mountain Rangers marching through an unidentified city, half of them lacking all facial features. Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers accompany them on horseback, their faces covered by black masks. One of the Rangers seems to be one of the individuals from the Parawatch group. The last file on the phone is an audio performance of the Canadian National Anthem. In an interview with Mercier, when asked about what happened to the group while they were camping, she initially just claims that nothing eventful happened to them other than a mountain ranger stopping by on a noise complaint and confiscating some stuff. When further pushed about the files on the phone, she asks the interviewer if a ranger asked them for a rifle, would they give them a rifle? The interviewer says that they would, if it was necessary for defense. Mercier then asks if a ranger came down and asked for your electronics and your lives, would you give it to them? The interviewer of course says no, they wouldn't, causing Mercier to slam her hand on the table and begin coughing profusely until a burnt cell phone battery is ejected from her mouth. She finishes by saying that people have to sacrifice for their country, and if you can't handle that, then you don't deserve protection. I'm betting that you'd like an explanation for all of that, but unfortunately there isn't one, and that's the point. That's actually a big hallmark of Parawatch SCPs, that there isn't a neat and tidy dissection of how these things operate. Yes, the Foundation's involved and have documented it, but 
they can't contain it, so they just focus on making sure no one else stumbles upon it. It's utterly strange and alien to our understanding, and that's how it will remain. If all of this sounds like a bunch of creepy pasta in the SCP universe, that's good, because it should. Parawatch is meant to sort of be an in-universe version of the early SCP wiki, trying to capture that feeling of stumbling upon something slightly unsettling and unusual. I've covered a lot of groups of interest that are highly consequential and impactful to the overall SCP universe, such as the Global Occult Coalition or the Sarkic Cults. But Parawatch is highly insignificant in comparison. They aren't a threat to normalcy or to the Foundation. They're just a small assortment of individuals with an interest in the strange and the paranormal. And personally, I can relate to that. 